Adam, Father in heaven, Father, we're thankful that we can be here. We're thankful that we can study your word. We're thankful, Father, that you've given us uh, books like the book of Genesis to help us understand uh, not only creation, uh, but to understand your promises to Abraham and Israel and all the things that go along with that, Father. Father, it helps us understand why there is sin and suffering in the world. And because of all these things, Father, we can have greater faith in you. And so, Father, we just praise you and we honor you because you've given us this book to study and uh, your word to read. And Father, let us uh, read it and draw close to you. Amen. Father, as we gather again in the study, we pray you bless us and open our hearts. And we would pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, the book of Genesis begins with, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and the Spirit of God hovered on the face of the deep. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And he called the light day, and he called the darkness night. That's how the book of Genesis begins. That's how the Bible begins. That's how we look at, I mean, when you, put, when you open the Bible for the first time, if you've never, you know, hotel room, Gideon's Bible, you open it up to the first chapter, that's how it begins. In fact, the word, I, I believe the word is pronounced bereshit, is the Hebrew word that's the first word in the Bible, and it means beginnings. In the beginning, God. And so when we study this book, uh, that's how we're going to look at it. In the beginning, God. Um, the book of Genesis is a book about beginnings. It's a book about the beginning of the world. It's a book about the beginning of man. It's a book about the beginning of sin. It's a book about the beginning of Israel with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. It's a book that tells us, and we'll see, where we got to where we're getting. <laughs> it's a book that tells us why there's sin in the world. It's a book that tells us, really, it's a book that begins the promise of a Savior. Amen. So when we look at this book, we wonder sometimes, you know, I, I don't know if you're like me, but um, how often do you read the Old Testament? I mean, do you just do it every year because it's part of your Bible reading plan? I've done this before, but if you pull out your Bible, and some of you don't have Bibles, you have phones now and you've got, or tablets, and that's great. But if you pull out your Bible and look at the, the, the side of it, can you tell where the Old Testament and the New Testament begins? So if I were to just go like this and open my Bible, it's right where Matthew begins. How do I tell that? Because the pages on the right side of my Bible are more worn than the pages on the left side of my Bible. I spend more time over here than I do over here. Can you do the same thing? When we're preaching sermons and stuff, in fact, I just, saw, I just saw the notes for the sermon today. They're out of the book of Matthew. You know, a majority of the, of the scriptures that we read in our sermons are out of the, book of, of the books of the New Testament. And you say, of course they're out of the New Testament because that's what we live by. But if you ignore the study of the Old Testament or ignore the reading of the Old Testament, you miss out on so much because the Old Testament explains why Jesus Christ came. There are some 300 plus um, prophecies about Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. Expl I mean, born of a virgin, born in Bethlehem, a Nazarene. All of these things are in the Old Testament. I once preached a sermon here before we had Jeff, so it was like 30 years ago, called The Old Testament is Our Friend. And I got, it was actually, uh, if you've read, the, if you've read the, the Bible, you get to the first chapter, is creation, that's great. Second chapter, oh, creation again, that's great. Third chapter, fall of man, that's pretty tough. Fourth chapter, Cain and Abel, that's hard. Fifth chapter, genealogies. It's like, all of a sudden, you, and do you get stopped at the genealogies? You look at a genealogy and say, why is this here? Well, I'm not a regular person. So when I got to that genealogy, I thought, huh. This is really cool. Adam was 103 year old, or three years old when he begot Seth. And you know what I did? I got out a piece of paper and a pencil, 
And I started writing down, okay, he was 103 year old, three years old, and he lived to be 960, I can't remember, 967 or something like that. 950. That was Noah, wasn't it? Didn't Noah live to be 950? Adam was 930. 930. I started, I started charting it out. I got out an Excel spreadsheet and I put bars on it and I said, and, and I started doing a timeline of all that. And you know, one of the reasons why I did that is because I wanted to know, how was Noah such a righteous man? He was a righteous man in the midst of an evil and perverse generation. How was he such a righteous man? I was wondering, you know, Enoch was his grandfather, or great-grandfather. I wonder if he knew Enoch, because Enoch walked with God, and he was not, because God took him. So I was looking at that, and I was wondering, did they know each other? How do you tell? Can you tell? Yes, you can, because you can plot out the dates and the names and everything in the book of Genesis chapter 5 and find out whether Enoch knew Noah. And when we get to chapter 5, I'll tell you the answer to that. Again, this is a book of beginnings. And the Old Testament is our friend because it helps us understand the New Testament so much better. We have a discussion every once in a while about the Lord's table. In fact, in Genesis, I'm sorry, it's 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. It says that Christ is our Passover. What does that mean? Unless you've read the book of Exodus, you don't know what that really means. So we're going to spend, I don't know how many weeks in the book of Genesis. We're going to spend a lot of time in the first 10 chapters, 11 chapters, 12 chapters of Genesis. And then we're going to slide through the rest of it a little bit faster. The first few chapters of Genesis are foundational to our understanding of God. They're foundational to our understanding of what sin is and why we need a Savior. And like I said, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, it's the first promise of that. Most, most people understand that that's the first messianic promise. God's saying, I'm going to give you a Savior. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. So as we get into this, Let's see. So, uh, and, and I got in my notes. Why do you think that God went to all the trouble of preserving the Old Testament for over 4,000 years? Just so we can read it once in a while? No, he wants us to understand it. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be the first to tell you, reading through the prophets sometimes, it's like mind-numbing. But at the same point in time, if you take your time and you take to try to understand it instead of just read it, you'll benefit from it greatly. So let's go into this a little bit. Let's see what, what to expect. Um, I love Jeff uh, came up to me last week uh, and he said, I'm looking forward to your class on the book of Genesis. He said, I love history. I said, so do I. So what's that automatically tell you about Jeff? He thinks that Genesis is a book of history. So do I. It's not a book of fairy tales. It's not a book of myth. It's not a book of allegory. And we'll get to, I'll, I've got a whole bunch of slides on why that's the case that'll come up in a little bit later. It's not just some story that someone told around a campfire and said, you know, um, and there are a lot of stories that people told around campfires to try to explain how the world came into being. But God told Moses how the world came into being. And Moses wrote that down. Um, there's some controversy when it comes to this. Let's see, I was going to tell you what to expect. Um, we're going to look at this as history as it's presented and try to understand how it pertains to us. Uh, and we're going to find things that should edify us. Uh, I think that creation itself is one of the most edifying chapters in the whole book of the Bible. Um, we're going to try to find things that make us think, and we're going to look at things in a different light. Um, here is the outline of the book of Genesis. Uh, Creations chapter 1 and 2, the fall of Adam, Cain and Abel, chapters 4 and 5, the flood, chapters 6 through 9, the beginning of the nations in the Tower of Babel, 10 and 11, and then you've got Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph in those, in those chapters. That's how the book breaks out roughly. That's how we're going to look at it. Um, it's the, we're, like I said, we're going to spend a lot of time on creation and really the flood, uh, the flood is responsible for so much of this world. Amen. Um, and 
I can't wait to get to that. Um, and by the way, if you want an interesting website uh, to, to go look at and to play around with, go look at the Answers in Genesis website. The guys who created the Answers in Genesis website are the ones who put that big boat in Kentucky, the, the, the model of the ark. And I, we went there last year. That is just an amazing uh, tourist, <laughs> tourist attraction, and it's really uplifting. Go ahead, Mike. I would also recommend a website called In the Beginning, by the, and the book was written by Walt Brown. You can, you can read the whole book okay. uh, online, and there's, he, uh, especially uh, regarding the flood, and so I just, I'll say that. Yeah, and, and uh, there's, there, there are a whole bunch of books on flood geology and stuff like that that we may mention some of those titles as we go through. But uh, this is all, to me, you, you might look at the book of Genesis as, oh, okay, um, what does this really have to do with me? But I look at it and, and she, Sheila's back there, I love it. I love it. And I do too. And I hope that, I hope that by the end of this class, you'll love it too. Um, because it is an exciting, amazing story. Um, when, we get to the, when we get to Joseph, we have really a type of Christ in Joseph. Amen. He's a savior of his people. Um, we have promises that are made. In fact, if you want to understand God's promises, go to the book of Genesis. Because God makes promises in the book of Genesis, and he keeps them. And, and throughout the Old Testament, in fact, that's one of the things I think about the New Testament God makes promises in the New Testament, but he, you don't really see him keeping them in the New Testament yet. I mean, there are, there are promises and stuff, and, and you can see that. But in the Old Testament, he makes promises, and he, he keeps them. Um, I love the story when, when Moses is on the mountain, uh, and, and Israel is down in the camp, and they're sinning, and they're making a golden calf, and God says, get off this mountain. I'm going to destroy these people, and I'm going to make a great nation out of you. Now, the interesting thing is, is that he had made a prom the same promise to Abraham. And you know what? Even if he had made a great nation out of Moses, he would have still been keeping his promise to Abraham. Amen. Because Moses is a descendant of Abraham. The thing is, is that God made a promise to Abraham that I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to give you a son. I'm going to make you a blessing to those who bless you. And he kept every one of those promises. So when God promises you that you will have life unending, what do you know? That he's going to keep his promise. That's one of the things that the Old Testament does for us. Okay, so uh, the problem is, uh, I, I'm sorry, going back, the key verse would be Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, if you want to look it up, and Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, the promise to Abraham. Um, What's the purpose of the book of Genesis? Go ahead. Partly. Partly. Um, if you're, for us, it's the beginning. It's the beginning. Uh, and so what, what uh, Linda said is, is to show the lineage of Jesus. And Bill didn't get there in time um, with the microphone. But it is partly to show us that. But we can get that out of Matthew chapter 1, right? Jesus, the genealogy of Jesus Christ. We can get that out of Matthew chapter 1. We can get it out of Luke chapter uh, 3, where it goes all the way back to, to Adam. Um, uh, and by the way, those will come in later in our conversation, but do you suppose Matthew and Luke thought that the book of Genesis was historical or allegory? Historical. Well, historical, because they used the genealogies out of there. Um, the same thing with the, the writer of uh, First Chronicles, because First Chronicles, the first several chapters, are the repeats the genealogies that we see in the book of Genesis. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of stealing my own thunder there, Bill. But uh, <laughs> the thing is, is that, so, so if you're looking at the book of Genesis, for us, um, if you want to know about salvation, you have to go back to the book of Genesis. Because you need to know why we're in the state that we're in. If the Bible is a book about salvation... If it's a treatise or if it's, if it's God's, uh, uh, what is it, when you doctorate on, on, the, on what salvation is, the book of Genesis is the thesis of that doctrine. It's the statement that says, why is salvation necessary? That's what it is for us. What do you suppose it was for the Jews, for the Israel, Israelites? 
It was, how did we get where we're at? If you think about it, because the book of Genesis is a historical account of what happened since beginning until the Jews went down into Egypt, or the Israelites went down into Egypt with 70 people, or 72, depending upon which uh, translation you use. And then the book of Exodus starts with what? Either 215 or 400 years later, depending upon your understanding of that. So it tells you exactly where, you, where they got to where they're at. It's their history up until that point in time. It explains to them why they're in the situation that they're in. And then Exodus is, is where we really pick up the, the, the narrative that where Moses is, is really kind of first person telling you what's going on, not in first person, but he's the first person author of that, telling you what's going on in the book of Exodus. So there's two ways to look at the book. For us, it's, it's more overreaching. For the Jews, it's the beginning of the Pentateuch. It's the beginning of the Torah or the law. It's the beginning of what they want to see or uh, to, to show them how they got where they're at. So uh, that's just something to keep in mind as we go through it. Again, for us, it's a history lesson. Uh, there, should be two, there should be two verses that come to mind uh, in, when, you're, when we're talking about the Old Testament. The first one's in Romans chapter uh, 15, verse 4. And it says, whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through hope, the, uh, we, sorry, that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. So Romans 15 says, and the things that were written before are the Old Testament, that if we read the Old Testament, we should get what out of it? And hope, and hope, right? Encouragement, hope. We should get all these things by reading the Old Testament. Again, partly because we can see that God keeps his promises. We can see that God is steering events to where we get the Savior. We can see all these things, and, and it's quite impressive. Um, so the other one is, uh, is 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 10, verse 1, which says that these things are examples to you that you might not sin in the way that they sin. That's a paraphrase. So <clears throat> you want to know how to please God? You can read the Old Testament. You want to know how to displease God? Read the Old Testament. Uh, and, the, and, and what the Corinthian writer, what Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1, it says, don't do that. Um, he's re directly referring to uh, Numbers chapter 25 uh, in that. And so we can, we can learn from those things and, and understand. So uh, when I do a background on a book, I like to look at to see if there's any controversy in a book like who the author is and, and the date of it and stuff like that. Is there any controversy on who wrote the book of Genesis? Oh, yes. Of course. Oh, tons and tons of controversy. And why is there controversy on who wrote the book of Genesis? Mike. Because the book of Genesis provides the uh, mindset uh, for just about everything that goes against uh, our current culture. Right. And it, it, of course, is the foundation of anyone's belief in the true God. That's the word I like is that word foundation. It's foundational, right? And I've got a cartoon that I'm going to show later uh, from the Answers in Genesis folks, which shows that, that the, the humanists and stuff attack are attacking our foundation. Um, and, and the foundation being the creation and God and, and all the things you just said, Mike. And uh, we're attacking other things. We're not attacking the, the, their foundational stuff. We're attacking other things. And, and so uh, that's one of the reasons why. And so uh, I've, got, I've got controversy in Genesis over authorship, over the historical authenticity of the book of Genesis. And we'll see why that's so. And over creation. Um, these are all different different things uh, that people look at and they say, <clears throat> that's just not right. Now, Christians don't look at those and say, that's just not right. Um, why do we accept the word as the word of God? Because it says it is. And I'm going to show you reasons why the book of Genesis is the word of God as well. So uh, as we get into that, but one of the first things that we see is, is who wrote the book of Genesis? It says right up there, right? Does your Bible say that? The first book of Moses called Genesis? <clears throat> or does it just say the book of Genesis? 
the King James and, and a, lot of the, a lot of ones say the first book of Moses called Genesis. And Exodus is the second book of Moses called Exodus. And you can guess what Leviticus is called and Numbers and Deuteronomy, right? So um, who wrote the book of Genesis? <clears throat> prove it. You could, except Jesus never says that Mo Mike says that he would use the words of, of Jesus to prove it, but Jesus never says directly that there is no quote in the New Testament that I'm aware of where someone says, Moses wrote in the book of Genesis, or Moses wrote. Now, Exodus, that's, not, that's the case. Uh, have you not read what, what the, in the burning bush passage, what Moses said, that Jesus said that? So we know that Jesus attributes the book of Exodus directly to Moses. But the one thing that you can't do, as far as I know, is you can't look in the Bible and see that the Bible refers back to the book of Genesis as being authored by Moses. So when I say prove it, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to prove it. <laughs> but um, I cannot say definitively and dogmatically that Moses wrote the book of Genesis. And really, I don't think you can either. And if you can, please tell me, because I really want that scripture. Bill. That is accepted by, by Jesus as being part of the Old Testament inspiration. Of course, it's clear. Yes, that's, that, is, that is clear. Yeah, whether or not Moses for sure absolutely wrote it, yeah, I think, yeah, I'm not sure you put that, but you got it for Sam. But we know it's inspired by God. And, and, uh, is your mic on? Pardon me? Is your mic on? I don't think it's, I think it's muted. <laughs> no, but I, I'm just hoping that the, uh, what, what Jeff is, I'm sorry, what Bill is saying is that uh, uh, there are verses that show that Genesis is being quoted. In fact, Genesis is the third most quoted book in the New Testament. Um, so is it the word of God? Absolutely, it's the word of God. Um, but is it, um, uh, can you prove that Moses wrote it? I don't think you can. But Having said that, I'll give you the cut, I'll cut to the chase here. It doesn't matter because it's the word of God. And Jesus himself refers back to that. Um, Bill, Mike has a comment if you've got your mic on. That mic. Too many mics, <laughs> including this one. I don't think so. So no doubt it's a challenge. I mean, what I haven't looked at uh, recently, but I would go back to Matthew 19, where there are the, the Sadducees or the I'll Jews get are asking about I'll get marriage and, and what can you divorce your wife for? And, and Moses comes up. Yeah, and, but he's quoting and Deuteronomy. And one Moses. more time? He's quoting the book of Deuteronomy. Um, actually, he says, what does right, Moses say? Right, but then say? Jesus refers back to, he says, from the beginning, which is Genesis, yep, yep. it wasn't so. So it's not an absolute proof. But it just seems to me that's why that's why I said. Well, oh, I, I agree with you. I agree with what you're saying. It's just that he doesn't say Moses says it. Amen. You're right. Um, so it, it's it's you know cutting you know splitting hairs, but at the same point in time, um, I don't think you can dogmatically say that from that passage. Yep. And uh, but we'll get to that, and that's one of the reasons. Uh, Bill Bill has a comment. <laughs> He'll forget. You know, it really wouldn't matter if, if, uh, if the scriptures do say or don't say that Moses wrote the first book. But the Jews accepted it. They accepted the, the, the book of Genesis as being written by Moses and being inspired by God. Yep. No, I, I totally agree with that. And, 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 and that's, the, that's actually, you know, if you want to know my position on it, that's my position on it, that Moses wrote the book of Genesis. Um, it's universally accepted by the Jews. It's universally accepted by the church up until the, the 17 or 1800s. Um, so uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to argue against that, but uh, it's interesting. It's interesting to me, and I just want you to be prepared. Uh, some of you haven't studied this before. I want you to be prepared to understand that there are those who say Moses is not the author of this book, and not only that, that it's not a real book. Uh, Mike, you had a comment. Yeah, the, um, the uh, liberal theologists that 
that address this claim that there are several different uh, individuals who were writing. I'll, I'll get to that. And uh, I, I will get to the, the documentary criticism thing, uh, 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 hypothesis. Go okay. ahead, though. Well, I, I was just going to say one of their arguments is that the five books of Moses uh, evidence different stylistic writing and and the fact of the matter is that's not an explanation at all an individual can use different stylistic writing techniques to convey different information and that's clearly what the holy spirit did through moses right so so um this guy's name is asa gray and he's long dead um but you'll notice where he was teaching uh where he was a professor is is yale divinity school um this guy was a friend of charles darwin he was a botanist. He was a believer. And he wrote a lot about this sort of stuff. But one of the things, if you see here, I've got bolded here. He says, but he says, I trust that the veneration due to the Old Testament is not impaired. In other words, we can still venerate the Old Testament. Is not impaired by ascertaining that mosaic is not an original but a compiled cosmology. This is the, starting around this time period, uh, around the 1700s, late 1700s, 1800s, um, people started looking at the Bible and saying, you know, I've, I noticed some things. In fact, the next guy I'm going to show you a picture of, and a quote from him, I noticed that there are differences here in style and in, in the way it's written and stuff like that. And, and so this guy, Asa Gray, very intelligent, important man in his time, says it's a compiled cosmology, which means that he, that he doesn't believe that Moses wrote it. That he said that's why mosaic is not an original, but a compiled cosmology. When I was in school, I had an archaeology of the Bible class, so I'm going to show you a quote from that later on, that they're going to say, yeah, it's, not, it, it's compiled from earlier things like Babylonian creation stories and Sumerian cre creation stories and stuff like that. These guys... While this guy is still a believer, he doesn't believe that Moses authored the book. In fact, what he believes is that it was a compiled cosmology, is, is a compiled book. Um, and we'll get, to, we'll get to why that's the case. This next guy, uh, Jean Astruc, I believe is how you say his name, uh, Frenchman. He was a doctor in the court of one of the Louis uh, in France. And he wrote an anonymous book, a uh, set, of, a set of, of treatises or whatever, on on uh, things that he noticed about the Bible. And if you read the book of Genesis, you will notice two things right off the bat. Chapter one, it says, in the beginning, God. Chapter two says something different. It says the Lord God. Um, and it's, and it's, it's using actually a different word for God in chapter two. Chapter one uses the word Elohim. Chapter two uses the word Yahweh. And he noticed these two differences. And he says, okay, I wonder if Moses got these from different sources. This guy still believed that Moses wrote the Bible, but he was wondering, I wonder if he got these from two different sources when he compiled the book of Genesis. And so he, he writes about this, and, and uh, this says he played a fundamental part in the origins of critical textual analysis of the books of the Bible. He wrote it, published it, and a whole bunch of Germans said, that's what I've been thinking but I don't think Moses wrote the book at all. And they started doing this documentary hypothesis thing, which we're going to talk about in just a minute, um, which started criticizing the way the Bible was arranged. They noticed different things about it, like Mike said. Um, so uh, and it goes on. Uh, first try, uh, he was the first to try to demonstrate by using techniques of textual analysis that were commonplace in studying the secular classics, the theory that Genesis was composed based on several sources or manuscript traditions, an approach now called documentary hypothesis. Um, when I was first a uh, Christian, this was a big deal too. And I'm gonna show you why it's not a big deal. Um, and uh, we'll get to that in a little bit, but I want you to understand if you're a new Christian and you start reading, if you go out and start reading about the book of Genesis online or something like that, you're gonna run into this idea that Moses, not only did he not write it, uh, but it was some, some anonymous writer um, after they came back from exile in Babylon and what they were trying to do is create this Jewish, uh, create this Jewish backstory um, so that they could be a united nation after, the, after they came back from exile. And most of the time they say that Ezra wrote it, 
that Ezra compiled all this stuff and put it in, and uh, they, they make Ezra actually into some kind of super scribe because uh, not only the Pentateuch, but uh, you'd have to go through the entire Old Testament just about to get to the point where they are. So this guy is the, this guy, the guy who started it. Other people have been thinking it. He published it, and a lot of people said, yeah, I noticed that too. He noticed that chapter 1 and chapter 2 had different uh, formats. You're going to see that too. We're going to point that out when we get there. Um, he noticed that, and when he noticed it, he said, no. I, I, he, he didn't say that Moses didn't write it. He says, I wonder if he got it from different sources. And I'm going to tell you that may be possible. But it doesn't matter. <laughs> we'll get to why it doesn't matter uh, in just a little bit. I hope I get to that before we end the class so you don't not left on a, on a uh, cliffhanger here. Um, like I said, he noticed that Elohim and Yahweh were different, um, and he claimed that the name change was uh, indicated different sources that Moses used. Um, that brings us to this, this idea of documentary hypothesis, and this is a lot of stuff on the slide. But what you need to understand is a couple of, I've got them highlighted here, but they noticed that there are four different styles. The people who are criticizing the Bible notice that there are four different styles uh, and they named each one of them. The first style is the, is the first one is J. Uh, anything that mentions God as Yahweh. J stands for Jehovah, um, Yahweh. So when you see a passage like chapter 2, which says the Lord God, they said that's attributed to the J source. Um, then you've got the E, which is for Elohim, uh, or Elohim. I'm not sure how you actually say that. Elohim probably. Um, those are attributed to that source. But then they notice that there's, there's the, a whole bunch of stuff like Deuteronomy. In fact, the whole book of Deuteronomy. And they say, well, that was from a different source too. And here's why. And they explain why. And, and, and so then they've got the P, which stands for priest stuff. And that's like the stuff that comes out of the book of Leviticus. If you look at the book of Leviticus, it's almost entirely about priestly duties. And so you've got all of these, and what they're saying is, is that someone took all these sources and jumbled them up together, and voila, we get the New Testament, we get the Old Testament Pentateuch, we get the books of Moses. And if you look at the, I highlighted the dates, um, for J, it's proposed that this author wrote about 900 to 850 BC, which is around, it's past the time of David, uh, past the time of Solomon, probably in the middle of the kings somewhere, like Josiah or Hezekiah, something like that. Um, E-documents is supposedly written around 750 to uh, 700 BC. That would be just after the fall of the Northern Kingdom. Um, Deuteronomy, uh, perhaps, <laughs> I love that, perhaps, I should have bolded that, around the time of King Josiah's reforms in 621. Um, P, uh, priests uh, during the exile in Babylon after 586. So you're going to run into this if you're studying the book of Genesis. Um, people started criticizing the, not only Mosaic authorship, but the whole shooting match, the whole book of the law. Um, by the way, uh, Bill pointed out the Jews accept Mosaic authorship. They do. Um, this, is, this is their book. The Torah, the law, uh, the Pentateuch, however you want to call it, the first five books, this, they attribute Mosaic authorship to all of this. Um, does that make it right? Uh, not necessarily, but... They did it from an early time, and I will demonstrate that in just a little bit. But you got all of these things. It says, then around 400 BC, some redactors or editors um, supposedly combined these four independently written texts to form the Pentateuch as is now known uh, in the time of Jesus in modern times. That, in a nutshell, one slide is what documentary hypothesis is all about. And um, so you've got all this, all this information here, and I need to keep track of my time. Um, and often, like I said, credit is given to Ezra for doing much of the work in compiling and editing. And, um, but I want to point out there are several ways that Moses could get uh, this kind of, uh, could have t obtained the information that he had in, in, the, uh, new t or in the Pentateuch. The first is divine revelation. Who was around when God created the heavens and the earth? God was, right? <laughs> So if anyone wanted to tell you how it worked, who would it be? God, God right? So um, it's quite possible that God told Moses, you know, Moses is, is, is uh, 
going through his life, you know, his early years as prince of Egypt, his middle years as shepherd, his latter years as leader of the people, he spoke with God every day. He went to the temple. And what does it say about Moses? That God did not speak to him in dark sayings or dreams. It says he spoke to him face to face as a man speaks with his friend. You suppose that God ever sat down and said, you Moses, I want to tell you about the time that I created the world. First, I created light. And Moses go, can you imagine that? Then I created, then I created, uh, you know, then I created the heavens and the earth. And, 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 and could you imagine being in God's presence when God's telling you about creation? That would be so cool. Now, it's possible that Moses also got his, uh, it's possible that, like, that Jean Estruc is correct and that there were two sources of documents and, and Moses gathered those two sources of documents and put them in. Now, if that's the case, what do we know about those two documents? They're still inspired by God because Moses was an inspired writer, right? And so if he took, if he took two different sources in chapter 1 and chapter 2 about creation and brought them together, it's because God told him to. God said, that one's right. Bill, uh, Mike's got a comment. Um, and, and then he said, oh, this one's right too. I like the way this one's written. Uh, he, of course, I'm, I'm adding words there, but... Um, it doesn't matter because Moses is an inspired writer. Go ahead, Mike. I hope I'm not jumping too far ahead, but when we look at Jesus when he's talking to the Jews and he condemns them for teaching his doctrine, you know, teaching is the word of God, the word of men. Yep. In Matthew, Matthew chapter 15. Yeah. So regardless of how Moses compiled this, Jesus would have pointed it out because his whole emphasis was on it is written, word of God, it is written. So I have total faith in Genesis because Jesus had it and he, get, he made sure we had it. Yep. Yeah, and, and uh, what's one of your favorite verses in Bible in, uh, just a second, Sam. Uh, what's your, one of your favorite verses in, in your Bible? Uh, uh, second Timothy 3, uh, <laughs> 16. Yeah. Uh, uh, the word of God is... Uh, now I can't quote it. It's one of my favorites. So, so help me out. All scriptures inspired by God, profitable for doctrine, reproof, and yeah, yeah, yeah. All scripture is inspired by God. There you go. If All Genesis scripture. is scripture, it's inspired by God, and I would submit that Genesis is scripture. Your son has a comment back in the back. Um. I don't know how helpful this is with uh, the inspiration of uh, through Moses writing it down, but I believe there's his historical sources that they knew this account before Moses wrote it down. Um, of course, it would be easy for them to know it because it would have been handed down through Adam's generations and they got to see their great, great, great grandfather and he could tell them the story. And so in history, after Noah's flood, the origin, the, the, the king of China, which I don't know if they call him emperor back then, they didn't call him emperor. He wrote down the account of creation and he wrote the account down of the Garden of Eden. I have something about that later. Yeah, so I'm not saying that he was inspired to do that, but there's historical sources that, that parallel this account. He, he, he did, it's not exactly, but it's the, it's the same in, in generality of, you know, dark and light and water and earth and that God did it, right? Yep. And the same thing, uh, there's a lot of archaeologists, Christian ones, that they study Egyptian history, which that would be a different son of Noah. And they also, in their, in their carvings, are somewhat accounting the, this creation yep. story. Yeah, and the thing is, is, and I'll get to this. I'll get to this when we talk about the historical accuracy of it. Uh, it doesn't matter if the Babylonians have their own creation story. Um, it's natural that they would have their own creation story. Um, it's natural. Um, I've got a slide, a quote later that talks about the American Indians having uh, telling their flood story, and it's amazingly similar to uh, what the Bible says. 
And why do you suppose that is? It's because exactly what Sam said. When God confused the languages and the people and divided the earth in Genesis chapter 11, or the Tower of 11, 11 Genesis chapter 11, the Tower of Babel, they went everywhere. They knew the story of the flood. They knew the story of creation. But over time, it got corrupted. And here you have Moses telling the story of creation. And the thing is, is that they didn't have inspiration. So they got all these characters in there like Tiamat and Aniki and Gilgamesh and all those, all those kind of characters and stuff like that. And, and, but God, when he, said, when he spoke to Moses face to face, said, this is the real story. So um, I, just, I, I wanted to throw this, this thing out here about documentary hypothesis. Now I'm going to tell you why it's wrong. Um, and uh, again, the reason I'm doing this is to show you that people condemn the Bible. Now I'm going to show you why it's not accurate. And f the first reason is because the law itself tells us that Moses wrote it. Um, Genesis doesn't tell you that Moses wrote it, but everywhere afterwards did. Uh, and the reason for this is, is because when you get to the book of Exodus, Moses is right there. The first part of Exodus is Moses' story. And Moses is with them until the book of the end of the book of Deuteronomy. And if you look at that, if you look at it, you'll see, like in Exodus chapter 17, verse 14, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this for a memorial in the book and recount it in the hearing of Joshua. God told Moses to write this down. Numbers chapter 33, verse 2 says, Now Moses wrote down the starting points of their journeys at the command of the Lord. God told him, said, okay, I want you to do a travel log here, Moses. I want you to say, we went from this place to this place, and we stayed here this long, and we went to this place. And when God raised up the cloud, we went. And Moses faithfully wrote that down. Deuteronomy chapter 31, uh, verses 9 through 11 says, So Moses wrote this law and delivered it to the priests, the sons of Levi, who bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord, and to all the, is all the elders of Israel. And Moses commanded them, saying, At the end of every seven years, at the appointed time in the year of release, at the Feast of Tabernacles, and all Israel comes together before the Lord your God in the place which he chooses, you shall read this law before Israel in their hearing. All Israel in their hearing. The Old Testament, the law itself, says who wrote it. Moses. Moses wrote the law. Um, so, I mean, you can say that Moses didn't write it. But if you believe in the Bible, then who wrote it? Moses. Moses. That's the word I was looking for. Other Old Testament um, authors uh, refer to uh, the book of the law as being written by Moses. Uh, oh, actually, I've, yeah, sorry. I've got another one up here. Um, uh, Joshua 1.8. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. What book of the law shall not depart from Joshua's mouth? What does that tell you about the book of the law at that point in time? It was done. It was written. It was already compiled. Joshua, uh, Joshua is told by who? God. <laughs> by Jehovah. He says, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. So we know right there that the book of the law was already completed by the time we got to the Joshua. And who was Joshua the successor of? Moses. Moses. Right? Okay, so uh, Joshua uh, 8.31 says, As Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded the children of Israel, as it is written in the book of the law of Moses, who did the, who did the author of Joshua say the law was written by? Moses. Right? I, I, I don't want to... I'm trying to be, you know, hit you over the head with these, because you need to understand that the Bible itself says documentary hypothesis is kind of stupid. Um, 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 3, and, uh, and keep the charge of the Lord your God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commandments, his judgments, his testimonies, as is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper and do all, uh, in all that you do and wherever you turn. So as far as the book of 1 Kings goes, now when, they, when the documentary hypothesis people say that it was all compiled in about 500 B.C., uh, this, this would suggest to you that by the time of, of uh, First Kings, which is the time of David and Solomon, 1000 BC, that they were referring to the book of the law of Moses back then. 
Um, so uh, 2 Kings 14, verse 6, But the children of the murderers he did not execute according to what is written in the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded. Uh, and you can look also uh, at Ezra chapter 6, verse 18, Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 1, uh, Daniel chapter 9, verses 11 through 13, Malachi 4, 4. And if you want those references, I can send them to you because I'm going to go to the next, <laughs> the next, uh, I'm going to click forward here because I'm, oh, what, what time do I end? Okay, I've got four minutes. I put these up here again, just so you can have them. Uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, but also 2 Peter 1. Uh, 2 Peter 1 says that, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. The point that I want to make here is, is that let's just say, I don't believe it, but let's just say that Ezra or some unknown scribe compiled the law. I don't believe it, first of all, because of all those quotes I just gave you out of the scripture. But let's just say that that's the case. It does not matter. Because it's still inspired by the Holy Spirit. If the, in the case, so, that, and that's, that's really the point that I'm trying to get at with this, is that you don't have to be waylaid by this. You can look, it doesn't matter whether or not, they're not right, <laughs> but it doesn't matter whether or not they're right because it's still inspired by the Holy Spirit. It's still inspired by God. Holy men were moved by the Holy Spirit to write things down. And if that's the way we got the, the law of Moses, which again, I don't agree with, then it doesn't matter. It's still the word of God. In fact, we're going to get to it in a little bit. Mike made mention to it, Matthew 19 uh, verses one through four, they came to Jesus asking him, he says, what do you do? Can a man divorce his wife for just any cause? And Jesus says, uh, he said to them, uh, no, you know, and he, what does he refer back to? He refers back to Genesis chapter two, that a man shall leave his father and mother and be cleaved unto his wife. And they should become one flesh and what God has put together, no man should separate. What did Jesus think of the, of Genesis chapter two? It's the word of God. Amen. So again, it doesn't matter whether or not this is true. Again, it's not, but it doesn't matter because all scripture is given by inspiration. So uh, let's, let's move on a little bit. Uh, let's see. I have to find myself in my notes. Uh, that was a for, say, for, for the sake of argument. Uh, there we are. Okay, I want, that brings me to the next subject, which is history. Oh, the New Testament. I'm sorry. Uh, I didn't want to leave this out. Mike made uh, mention of this just a second ago. Um, Moses is, is, is universally, uh, in the New Testament, is universally regarded as the author of the law. Jesus regards him as the author of at least uh, Exodus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Because he, he quotes verses from those and says, As Moses said, so we know that Jesus, who is infallible, who is the Son of God, says that Moses wrote Exodus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. Um, what does that say about the other three, the other two books? Five, yeah, the other two books. <laughs> that Moses wrote those two. But you've got these verses here, Matthew 19, 8. Uh, he said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. That's Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 1 through 4. Moses, he, Jesus is attributing Deuteronomy to Moses. Um, John, uh, John 5, uh, verse 46, if you believed Moses, uh, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. Again, Deuteronomy chapter 18. Um, uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 10, for Moses writes about their righteousness, which is of law. The man who does those things shall live by them, which is actually quoting Leviticus, and that's Paul saying that Moses wrote the book of Leviticus. Uh, Mark chapter 12, verse 26, but concerning the dead that they rise, have you not read in the book of Moses in the burning bush passage how God spoke to them saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Uh, Moses is quoting ch uh, Exodus chapter 6 and says it's a book of Moses. 
right? So uh, again, the New Testament is also very clear in its testimony that Moses wrote uh, the, uh, the books of the law. Now again, what it doesn't ever say is Moses wrote the book of Genesis. However, <laughs> I'll leave that one up to you. And does it matter? Because Jesus Christ considered it scripture, so we should consider it scripture also. It looks like I'm out of time because I've got a red light up there. Um, so next time we'll start on the, this idea of whether it's historically accurate. And again, I'm gonna take a little extra time on, these, on, on this background so that we get well grounded in it. So that when we get to, uh, we got to the book by Genesis 1-1, I quoted it at the beginning of the class, so we did get into the text. I did that on purpose. So that when we actually get to it, we have a good understanding, a good basis, and we can see that, that yes, this is the word of God, and it is so powerful and so obvious and so great. So next time, thank you.